if you can tell me what interest rates are, I can tell you when we should build the factory. Bam. So he's got this uncertainty uh, as far as where the economy is going to be, and he's very hesitant. And now he is somebody that has learned lessons from the past where I see other companies never learning their lessons. There are lots of economic storm clouds ahead, but as they say, in every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. This first chart is a chart of, and this is from Game of Trades. Uh, the unemployment rate has uh, systematically spiked with yield curve steepening from inverted levels. Currently, the yield curve is steepening at a historically elevated rate, this is an ominous sign for the labor market. And what they point out here is, you know, th this is the yield curve and the inversions. Uh, so it's the percent either positive or negative. And what they're doing is they're taking the 10-year and the two-year treasury. Um, and you're, when it goes below this zero line, that's when the yield curve inverts. But then you'll, you'll notice that when it starts to rise, we have a recession after it starts to rise and unemployment goes up. Once this starts to rise, unemployment increases. And it's done this quite reliable, reliably. And we are now, we've been in the deepest yield curve inversion in a long, long, long time, way past this chart, if not like historically deep uh, yield curve inversions. And what you see here is that uh, the unemployment rate rises and then shortly thereafter a recession starts. So the unemployment rate rises with the yield curve going back, recovering from the inversion. And George Gammon pointed out that it, uh, the recession doesn't start when yield curves invert, they, they, it starts when yield curves start to uninvert, when they start to go back to normal. And, uh, but one of the things that I want to point out is look at the low levels that we've been at. It's the lowest levels on this chart. So I made another chart on the Federal Reserve's website, the FRED. And what you see here is that uh, the, we've, we've hit rates as low as 3.4%. But this chart goes all the way back to 1948. And what you see here is that low rates are a harbinger of a recession yet to come, recession and high unemployment. The economy contracts, companies aren't making as much profit, and so they have to lay off workers and unemployment goes up. And then the, the unemployment rate goes down and down and down, and the very low rates are predicting that there is going to be a recession and the rates go up, and this repeats over and over again. Low rates are a harbinger of a recession yet to come. And uh, what, the, what is most amazing about this chart is uh, here we have 3.4%. Now, the Fed is actually fudging some of these numbers, but still, you, the last time we were at 3.4% was 1969. These ultra-low employment numbers are saying that a recession is due. And now we have the yield curve starting to uninvert, if that's a word. <laughs> uh, this is Jesse Felder saying the evolution of uh, initial unemployment claims after yield curve inversion. So when the yield curve gets inverted, you start a clock ticking and you measure the number of months until the unemployment rate shoots up. And this is uh, 19... Uh, 69, 73, 79, 81, 1990, 2001, and 2007. So this is a lot of history that we're looking at here. This is pretty reliable, I should say. And what we're seeing is that this is, you know, data takes a month or two to compile. So the data where this chart, I can almost guarantee you, uh, is uh, at least... Uh, a month or two behind when it says today right here. Uh, and this is the 10-year minus the three-month treasury, not the 10-year minus the two-year. 
But what you see is that this was at 12 months. We're probably actually at 13 or 14. And it takes a while for unemployment to dramatically start increasing. We see this 2001, leading into the 2001 recession. This gets really steep 14 months into it. And for this 2007 recession, that was 24 months. So somewhere between 14 and 24 months after the yield curve inverts is where we can expect, which is like now or, and over the next 10 months. That's when we can really expect uh, this, uh, the, unemployment, the, the recession to hit, the unemployment to take off, and uh, the <laughs> feces hitting the, uh, the rotational air acceleration device. <laughs> so um, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of economic data. And I just found this interesting when I came across it. Here we are on the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve's website, the uh, FRED. And what we see here is automotive. This is basically connected with automotive sales. This is automotive uh, loans that are owned and securitized. Uh, and so, you know, you see them drop off during the uh, global financial crisis of 2008. But what happened with the pandemic? Well, they gave out a whole bunch of free currency. They just said it started sending people checks. And so automo auto sales exploded shortly after they started all of this stimulus. Now, what happens when you, I mean, some of these people, that got the extra stimulus and bought a car. Some of them are responsible people and they know how to take care of their finances. Others, however, are very irresponsible and they've just got cash in their hands, in their pocket, burning a hole in their pocket. And so they got to do so. Oh, I can afford a new car now or I can afford a, a used car and, you know, for a lot of these people. But still, they do it on an auto loan. So what happens with those people? Car owners fall behind on payments at highest rate on record. So this is not good news. And then lower down in that article, you'll see this chart that says it's at 6.1%. And you got to go all the way back to 1996 to see it get to 6%. So this is bad news. How does this affect the economy? Well, I can tell you that, you know, on this channel, when I mention Tesla or Elon Musk, I get hate mail. And so, you know, I've owned Teslas. My first Tesla was a 2010. I owned Tesla since before there was a Model S. 2010, my second Tesla was a 2011. But I'm going to stay away from that. I'm just commenting on the economics. Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, and he owns two of the largest companies in the world, and they are growing at tremendous rates. And so this is the Tesla Q3 earnings call. And this is just to sort of clarify and show you what this uncertainty can do to the growth of an economy. And here, I've taken this transcript, which is very long, and I've condensed it. So there's a lot of redacted stuff. When you see this, these lines in the middle, uh, I've taken many, many, many paragraphs out. And uh, then I went a little bit further, and I just highlighted the lines that I'm going to read you that, that pertain to what I'm talking about. So a question, could you please provide an update uh, on the opening schedule for Gigafactory in Mexico? Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. Giga factory in Mexico. Now this is the new factory. They purchased the land. They are planning on opening another factory. Remember in the Shanghai factory, it took 11 months from the first shovel of dirt to cars coming off the production line out the back of that factory. Only 11 months because all of the permitting and studies and everything, they just got fast-tracked into production. Uh, and so Elon Musk's response, in Mexico, we're laying the groundwork to begin construction and doing all of the long lead items. I'm gonna scroll this up a little, but I think 
we want to, to just get a sense of what the global economy is like before we go full tilt on the Mexico factory. I'm worried about the high interest rate environment that we're in. Uh, if interest rates remain high, or if they go even higher, it's much harder for people to buy a car. They simply can't afford it. And then I eliminated a whole bunch of stuff that had, had nothing to do with, with the point of what I'm trying to make here. Uh, question, you said that you're uh, not going full tilt on the plant in Mexico until there are signs that the economy is strong. And part of his answer here is, the question is really one of timing. And, there's, and I don't know if this is the, um, you know, this is an uh, auto transcription by a computer doing this. So uh, some of the words will be incorrect or maybe out of order here, but maybe this is what he said, maybe not. And there's going to be a broken record on the interest front. So I'm not sure if that line is correct. It's just <clears throat> the interest rates have, have to come down. Like if interest rates keep rising, you just fundamentally reduce affordability. It is just the same as increasing the price of the car. Now, Tesla has done many price increases lately to offset this. So it's just so I just don't have visibility into, and I'm not sure if this is a word here that uh, that uh, it didn't transcribe or if this is uh, him just having a thought and then going off on it. If you can tell me what interest rates are, I can tell you when we should build the factory. Bam. So he's got this uncertainty uh, as far as where the economy is going to be, and he's very hesitant. And now he is somebody that has learned lessons from the past where I see other companies never learning their lessons. But I am still somewhat scarred by 2009 when General Motors and Chrysler went bankrupt. While that's now 14 years ago, it it's... That is seared into my mind with a branding iron because kind of Tesla was just hanging on by a thread during that entire time with, I mean, we closed a financing round 2008 at 6 p.m. December 24th, Christmas Eve. And if we had not closed that financing round, we would have bounced payroll two days after Christmas. So we actually closed that round the last hour of the last day it was possible. Now, this meant they were, if they hadn't done that, the next hour, they were bankrupt. They would have had to file for bankruptcy. Uh, so stressful, to say the least. Then, and then barely made it through 2009. So I'm like, I, I just, I want to just, I don't want to be going top speed into uncertainty. A lot of war is going on in the world, obviously, as well. And we have room here. When he says we have room here, he means Tesla has more cash on hand than any car company on the planet. And they're the most profitable car company on the planet. So they are the ones <clears throat> that do have room. But even in that super strong position, he is pulling back on potential growth because he's worried about the global economy. Like I just, I'm not saying that things will be bad. I'm saying they might be. And I think like Tesla is an incredibly capable ship, but we need to make sure like as if the macroeconomic conditions are stormy, even the best ship is still going to have rough times. The weaker ships will sink. We're not going to sink, but even a great ship in a storm has challenges. Now that storm will apply to everyone, not just the automotive industry. It will apply to everyone. I think if interest rates start, if interest rates start coming down, we will accelerate. If anybody's got any good guess on this, I'd love to be less wrong. And I apologize if I'm perhaps more paranoid than I should be, because that might than I should be, because that might also be the case, because I'm I am I have. PTSD from 2009 big time, and 2017 through 2019 were not a picnic either. That was very tough going. And then his chief financial officer chimes in with, 
especially if there are wars going on and then that impacts your sentiment. And he sort of ends this section with, yes. I mean, people are reading about wars all over the world at this, I think, you know, this was supposed to be at this time and buying a new car tends to not be front of their mind. So this is the world's richest man running two of the largest companies on the planet, pulling back on growth in the future because of the uncertainty that the Federal Reserve and the government is causing. And a lot of this could be a distraction. I mean, they are having some severe currency problems. So um, uh, anyway, getting back to the economy, uh, Wall Street Silver, home prices, the home price to income ratio in the USA, this time is different. If you look closely, there's no note saying housing bubble this time. <laughs> that is what's different. So this is from Long Term Trends, a great website. And what you see here is that back in the 90s, uh, home prices were four times the typical household income. So the average uh, U.S. home price, probably the median U.S. home price, was four times the median income in the United States. And then we got into the uh, bubble of 2005, 6, and 7, and that was marked housing bubble. And it fell down during the crisis and, and bottomed in about 2012, 2011, 2012, at less than five times income, 4.75. And there's a change here in, in data. Robert Schiller used to report monthly, and I believe this is Robert Schiller uh, no longer updating his uh, house price index uh, monthly, but doing it like uh, quarterly, semi uh, semi-annual or annual. And, uh, and here we are at 7.25, the greatest bubble on this chart. So real estate going into this crisis, real estate has the furthest to fall. This is really, really dangerous. And then we go to the condition of the banks. And Rick Rule and I were talking about this just a few videos ago. This is unrealized losses on lenders' balance sheets. So this is basically the banks, the lenders. And the thing about this is uh, the securities that they hold, the, uh, the U.S. treasuries, the ones that are available to, for sale, they have marked to market, and they can sell them right away. The, and those are usually like one-month treasuries. So they were purchased at a yield that is very close to what the yield is today. Uh, but the long-term treasuries, all these red ones that are uh, held, held to maturity, uh, the reason that they are held to maturity is you know, they're expecting that they're not for sale, but those are typically underwater. Like the 30-year treasury has fallen 53% uh, since March of, two th of 2020. So if they bought a 30-year treasury before that, the yield on the new treasuries is so much higher that the ones that they purchased are almost worthless. They have dropped 53%. And these are all of those <clears throat> treasuries that they do not have to mark to market because they're saying, we're going to hold these until they mature. Well, look at the amount of, uh, of securities held to maturity back in the 2008 crisis versus today. Uh, what is happening here is the banks get to lie to us. This is a get-out-of-jail-free card, except it comes back to haunt them. They're not out of jail. Instead of being in jail, they get executed. <laughs> they, get, they, get, they go out of business when all of this gets to, disclosed as Silicon Valley and First, uh, uh, I can't remember, First Republic and, uh, and man, Credit Suisse. Uh, you know, this is big. It is huge. The economy is in a real bind right now. This crisis, I've said many times, Silicon Valley and, and what happened in, in March, April, May of this year, that was just the first leg down. And so it only exposed the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is uh, U.S. is forecast to run persistently large budget deficits. And so this is the uh, uh, fiscal balance as a share of GDP, which is a great way to measure this. How much are we spending uh, over our GD GDP? 
So this isn't uh, this is the budget deficit as compared to the GDP. And you can't re if your GDP if you're spending more than your GDP, there's no chance of ever catching up. Now the source is the Congressional Bu Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget. I did a study on this years ago, and I used to travel with Robert Kiyosaki in 2005 through 10, not through 10, but uh, to the middle of, of 2010. And I had my crew go back and look at the years uh, when they would, the Congressional Budget Office and uh, the uh, Office of Management and Budget and the uh, Comptroller General uh, the, uh, and see what, if it's a government office, what were they projecting out in the future? And they were projecting back then that all of this was supposed to go positive. We were not supposed to have budget deficits. They always missed it and they missed it by a long shot. In other words, they fabricate a lie that is telling that they're going to tell you to give you some hope for the future. And all of this gray area here is that lie, and the lie is depressing. <laughs> I just can't believe that this is their rosy scenario because they always paint a rosy scenario. So let's go and, you know, here, here I'm going to demonstrate the lie. Do you see this blue area? They're saying that we had four years in a row of budget surpluses. Now, if you uh, make more than your income, that means that you should be in, in if you're in debt, or even if, if you're uh, just at neutral, you're not in debt, but you don't have savings. If you make more than your income, you have savings. If you're in debt, you, you can pay down your debt, and uh, you shouldn't be showing a deeper debt each year. Every one of these years, the debt should have grown. But during these years, if you made more than you spent, your debt should be less. So let's take a look at, at the Federal Reserve's uh, the, the total, the federal debt, total public debt. So the federal debt, they're the ones that get to spend it, and they stick us with the bill. Now, I want to point out that this is as of Q2 of 2023. It's actually about 3.5 trillion now instead of, or 33.5 trillion instead of 32.33 trillion. Uh, now that is because this was updated September 1st for the second quarter. So on December 1st is about when we're going to find out what the third quarter was, what our, our current is. We're going to find out that it'll, the graph will say that 33 something trillion. But what I want to do here is take this and, you know, what you can see in here is we go up and we reach the debt ceiling and it goes flat. We go up and it reaches the debt ceiling again and it goes flat. And we go up and it reaches another debt ceiling and so on. And the debt ceiling is just this uh, thing where they're trying to, it, it's ridiculous, don't pay any attention to it anymore because they're always going to lift it or do what they're, they've done right now, suspend it until after the next election cycle so they, it doesn't hurt the incumbents running for re-election and uh, currently, and either if the incumbent wins, he gets to deal with it when uh, he's not going to lose his job over it, uh, or it's somebody else's problem. So let's switch this to annual. And what that does is it sort of smooths the data. But now, uh, since it's annual, it's uh, taking in the, uh, it's, it's measured up to the fourth quarter of last year, uh, which would be uh, you know, this, I believe, is a fiscal year. So that's going to be as of September 30th last year. Uh, but what that's done is it's smoothed uh, all of the data nicely. Now, let's focus in on those budget surplus years. These, This is when, these are all those years when we made more than our income. Do you see any year... Where, where the deficit, where the, where the debt is going down. If you made more than you in, your income for these four years in a row, the debt should have gone down. It was a lie. And uh, so 
uh, let's let's move on here. Uh, in every dark economic cloud, there is a silver and gold lining. Notice there's more silver here than there is gold. There is a lot of economic dark clouds like I just showed you. So that that ratio of silver to gold lining in that cloud, what is it? Let's take a look at uh, FX Empire. So this is, uh, it has to do, this site has to do with uh, trading currencies. Gold price forecast experts predict $10,000 gold and $300 silver. Well, a quick look at that. You know, right now we've got close to $2,000 gold. So this is going to go up by a factor of five. But currently we have less than $24 gold. So this is going to, according to these experts, silver should rise by a factor of more than 12. I want to thank you for watching. Smash that like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I just wanted to tell you about Gold Silver's 111 ounce silver giveaway where you can win, 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 one, one, one. One one ounce silver bar, one 10 ounce silver bar, and one 100 ounce silver bar. So enter today and win.